M. Conservation Laws Conservation laws restrict the use of depleting resources and force owners to invest in the maintenance of replaceable natural resources. The effect of both cases is similar. The restriction of present production for the supposed benefit of future production. This is obvious in the case of depleting resources. Factors are also compelled to maintain replaceable resources, such as trees, when they could have more profitably engaged in other forms of production. In the latter case, there is a double distortion. Factors are forcibly shifted to future production, and they are also forced into a certain type of future production, the replacement of these particular resources. Clearly, one aim of conservation laws is to force the ratio of consumption to saving investment lower than the market would prefer. People's voluntary allocations made according to their time preferences are forcibly altered, and relatively more investment is forced into production for future consumption. In short, the state decides that the present generation must be made to allocate its resources more to the future than it wishes to do. For this service, the state is held up as being far seeing compared to short sighted free individuals. But presumably, depleting resources must be used at some time, and some balance must always be struck between present and future production. Why does the claim of the present generation weigh so lightly in the scales? Why is the future generation so much more worthy that it can compel the present to carry a greater load? What did the future ever do to deserve privileged treatment? Anthony Scott points out that this attitude rests on the contemptuous and unsupported view that future generations will not be as competent to take care of themselves as is the present generation. Indeed, since the future is likely to be wealthier than the present, the reverse might well apply. The same reasoning applies to all attempts to change the market's time preference ratio. Why should the future be able to enforce greater sacrifices on the present than the present is willing to undergo? Furthermore, after a span of years, the future will become the present. Must the future generations then also be restricted in their production and consumption because of another wraith like future? It must not be forgotten that the aim of all productive activity is goods and services that will and can be consumed only in some present. There is no rational basis for penalizing consumption in one present and privileging one future present, and there is still less reason for restricting all presents in favor of some will o' the wisp future that can never appear and lies always beyond the horizon. Yet this is the goal of conservation laws. Conservation laws are truly. Pie in the sky legislation. As Scott aptly asks, why agree to preserve resources as they would be in the absence of their human users? And further, most of our progress has taken the form of converting natural resources into more desirable forms of wealth. If man had prized natural resources above his own product, he would doubtless have remained savage, practicing conservatism. If the logic of tariffs is to destroy the market, then the logic of conservation laws is to destroy all human production and consumption. Individuals in the market decide on the time structure in their allocation of factors in accordance with the estimated revenue that their resources will bring in present as against future use. In other words, they will tend to maximize the present value at any time of their land and capital assets. The time structure of rental income from assets is determined by the interest rate, 
which in turn is determined by the time preference schedules of all individuals on the market. Time preference, in addition to the specific estimated demands for each good, will determine the allocations of factors to each use. Since a lower time preference will connote more investment in future consumers' goods, it will also mean more conservation of natural resources. A high time preference will lead to less investment and more consumption in the present, and consequently to less conservation. In some cases, however, lower time preferences and greater investment activity will deplete natural resources at a more rapid rate if there is a particularly great demand for their use in the new activity. This is likely to be true of such resources as coal and oil. Most conservationist arguments evince almost no familiarity with economics. Many assume that entrepreneurs have no foresight and would blithely use natural resources only to find themselves someday suddenly without any property. Only the wise providential state can foresee depletion. The absurdity of this argument is evident when we realize that the present value of the entrepreneur's land is dependent on the expected future rents from his resources. Even if the entrepreneur himself should be unaccountably ignorant, the market will not be, and its valuation, that is, the valuation of interested experts with money at stake, will tend to reflect its value accurately. In fact, it is the entrepreneur's business to forecast, and he is rewarded for correct forecasting by profits. Will entrepreneurs on the market have less foresight than bureaucrats, comfortably ensconced in their seizure of the taxpayer's money? Entrepreneurs with poor foresight are quickly expelled from their positions through losses. It is ironic that the plight of the Okies in the 1930s, widely publicized as a plea for conservation laws and the result of cruel capitalism, actually resulted from the fact that bad entrepreneurs, the Okies, farmed land that was valueless and submarginal. Forced conservation investment on this submarginal land, or government subsidization of the Okies, would have aggravated a dislocation that the market quickly eliminated. Much American soil erosion, furthermore, has stemmed from failure to preserve full private property rights in land. Tenant farmers, moving every few years, often milked the capital of the landlord's property, wasting the resource, in default of proper enforcement of the contractual necessity to return the land to its owner intact. Another error made by the conservationists is to assume a technology fixed for all time. Human beings use what resources they have. And as technological knowledge grows, the types of usable resources multiply. If we have less timber to use than past generations, we need less, too, for we have found other materials that can be used for construction or fuel. Past generations possessed an abundance of oil in the ground, but for them, oil was valueless, and hence not a resource. Our modern advances have taught us how to use oil and have enabled us to produce the equipment for this purpose. Our oil resources, therefore, are not fixed. They are infinitely greater than those of past generations. Artificial conservation will wastefully prolong resources beyond the time when they have become obsolete. How many writers have wept over capitalism's brutal ravaging of the American forests? Yet it is clear that American land has had more value-productive uses than timber production, and hence the land was diverted to those ends that better satisfied consumer wants.
A typical conservationist complainer was J.D. Brown, who in 1832 worried over the consumption of timber. Whence shall we procure supplies of timber fifty years hence for the continuance of our navy? Scott notes that the critics never seem to realize that a nation's timber can be purchased from abroad. What standards can the critics set up instead? If they think too much forest has been cut down, how can they arrive at a quantitative standard to determine how much is too much? In fact, it is impossible to arrive at any such standard, just as it is impossible to arrive at any quantitative standards for market action outside the market. Any attempt to do so must be arbitrary and unsupported by any rational principle. America has been the prime home of conservation laws, particularly on behalf of its public domain. Under a purely free enterprise system, there would be no such thing as a governmentally owned public domain. Land would simply remain unowned until it first came into use, after which it would be owned by the first user and his heirs or assigns. This system was dimly adumbrated by the Homestead Law of 1862. However, this law imposed an arbitrary and pointless maximum on the size of farm that could be staked out by the first user. This limitation had the result of nullifying the law further west, where the minimum acreage needed for cattle or sheep grazing was far larger than the antiquated legal maximum would allow. Furthermore, the maximum limitation and the requirement that the land be used for farming led to the very ravaging of the forests that conservationists now deplore for it hobbled private ownership of large forest tracts. The consequences of government ownership of the public domain will be further explored later. Here we may state a few of them. When the government owns the land and permits private individuals to use it freely, the result is indeed a wasteful over-exploitation of the resource. More factors are employed to use up the resource than on a free market, since the only gains to the users are immediate, and if they wait, other users will deplete the limited resource. Free use of a governmentally owned resource truly inaugurates a war of all against all, as more and more users, eager for the free bargain, attempt to exploit the scarce resource. To have a scarce resource, and to make everyone believe because of the free gift of use that its supply is unlimited, causes overuse of the resource, favoritism, figurative queuing up, etc. A striking example was the western grazing lands in the latter half of the 19th century. The government prevented cattlemen from owning the land and fencing it in, and insisted it be kept as open range owned by the government. The result was excessive use of the range and its untimely depletion. The government's failure to extend the homestead principle to the larger areas had another important social effect. It led to constant squabbles between the users, the cattlemen, and the other homesteaders who came later and demanded their just share of the free land. Another example is the rapid depletion of the fisheries. Since no one is permitted to own any segment of the sea, no one sees any sense in preserving the value of the resource as each is benefited only by rapid use in advance of his competitors. Leasing is hardly a superior form of land use. If the government owns the land and leases it to grazers or timber users, once again, there is no incentive for the lessee to preserve the value of the resource since he does not own it. It is to his best interest as a lessee to use the resource as intensively as possible in the present. Hence, leasing also depletes natural resources excessively.
In contrast, if private individuals were to own all the lands and resources, then it would be to the owner's interest to maximize the present value of each resource. Excessive depletion of the resource would lower its capital value on the market. Against the preservation of the capital value of the resource as a whole, the resource owner balances the income to be presently obtained from its use. The balance is decided, ceteris paribus, by the time preference and the other preferences of the market. High demand for the product increases the value of the resource, and thereby stimulates its preservation investment in it, and exploration for it. High-cost sources of supply will now be tapped, thus further increasing the effective supply of the product on the market. If private individuals can only use, but not own, the land, the balance is destroyed, and the government has provided an impetus to excessive present use. Not only is the announced aim of conservation laws to aid the future at the expense of the present illegitimate and the arguments in favor of it invalid, but compulsory conservation would not achieve even this goal, for the future is already provided for through present saving and investment. Conservation laws will indeed coerce greater investment in natural resources, using other resources to maintain renewable resources, and forcing a greater inventory of stock in depletable resources. But total investment is determined by the time preferences of individuals, and these will not have changed. Conservation laws, then, do not really increase total provisions for the future. They merely shift investment from capital goods, buildings, etc., to natural resources. They thereby impose an inefficient and distorted investment pattern on the economy. Given the nature and consequences of conservation laws, why should anyone advocate this legislation? Conservation laws, we must note, have a very practical aspect. They restrict production, that is, the use of a resource, by force, and thereby create a monopolistic privilege, which leads to a restrictionist price to owners of this resource or of substitutes for it. Conservation laws can be more effective monopolizers than tariffs, because, as we have seen, tariffs permit new entry and unlimited production by domestic competitors. There is another similarity between tariffs and conservation laws. Both aim at national self-sufficiency, and both try to foster national or local industries by coercive intervention in the free market. Conservation laws, on the other hand, serve to cartelize a land factor and absolutely restrict production, thereby helping to ensure permanent and continuing monopoly gains for the owners. These monopoly gains, of course, will tend to be capitalized into an increase in the capital value of the land. The person who later buys the monopolized factor, then, will simply earn the going rate of interest on his investment, even though the monopoly gain will be included in his earnings. Conservation laws, therefore, must also be looked upon as grants of monopolistic privilege. One outstanding example is the American government's policy, since the end of the 19th century, of reserving vast tracts of the public domain, that is, the government's land holdings. Reserving means that the government keeps land under its ownership and abandons its earlier policy of keeping the domain open for homesteading by private owners. Forests, in particular, have been reserved, ostensibly for the purpose of conservation. What is the effect of withholding huge tracts of timberland from production?
It is to confer a monopolistic privilege, and therefore a restrictionist price, on competing private lands and on competing timber. We have seen that limiting the labor supply confers a restrictionist wage on the privileged workers, while the workers pushed out by union wage rates or by licenses or immigration laws must find lower-paying and less value-productive jobs elsewhere. A monopoly or quasi-monopoly privilege for the production of capital or consumer goods, on the other hand, may or may not confer a monopoly price, depending on the configuration of the demand for the individual firms, as well as their costs. Since a firm can contract or expand its supply at will, it sets its supply with the knowledge that lowering output to achieve a monopoly price must also lower the total amount of goods sold. On the free market, the demand for each firm in equilibrium must be elastic above the equilibrium price, otherwise the firm would reduce output. This does not, of course, mean that the demand for the entire industry must be elastic. When we refer to a possible monopoly price, the demand consulted by each monopolistic firm is its own. The laborer need bother with no such consideration, aside from a negligible variation in demands for each laborer's total hours of service. What about the privileged landowner? Will he achieve a definite restrictionist or a possible monopoly price? A prime characteristic of a piece of land is that it cannot be increased by labor. If it is augmentable, then it is a capital good, not land. The same, in fact, applies to labor, which in all but long periods of time can be regarded as fixed in its total supply. Since labor in its totality cannot be increased, except, as we have noted in regard to hours of work per day, government restriction on the labor supply, child labor laws, immigration barriers, etc., therefore confers a restrictionist wage increase on the workers remaining. Capital or consumer goods can be increased or decreased, so that privileged firms must take their demand into account. Land, on the other hand, cannot be increased. Restriction of the supply of land, therefore, also confers a restrictionist price of land above the free market price. Another example of government creation of a monopoly gain in land has been cited by the Georgist economist Mason Gaffney. City governments all over the country deliberately keep dead lands off the market with the avowed purpose of protecting other land prices. Gaffney cites the head of the American Society of Planning Officials as advising that a vacant one-third of urban land be more or less permanently removed from private ownership in order to keep up land values for the owners of the remaining two-thirds. Gaffney concludes, Following this advice, many state and local governments avoid returning tax-reverted lands to use. The same is true for depleting natural resources, which cannot have their supply increased and are therefore considered part of land. If the government forces land or natural resources out of the market, therefore, it inevitably lowers the supply available on the market, and just as inevitably confers a monopoly gain and a restrictionist price on the remaining landowners or resource owners. In addition to all of their other effects, conservation laws force labor to abandon good lands and instead cultivate the remaining submarginal land. This coerced shift lowers the marginal productivity of labor and consequently reduces the general standard of living. Let us return to the government's policy of reserving timber lands, 
This confers a restrictionist price and a monopoly gain on the lands remaining in use. Land markets are specific and do not have the same general connexity as labor markets. Therefore, the restrictionist price rise is confined far more to lands that directly competed or would compete with the withdrawn or reserved lands. In the case of American conservation policy, the particular beneficiaries were a. the land-grant western railroads and b. the existing timber owners. The land-grant railroads had received vast subsidies of land from the government, not only rights of way for their roads, but 15-mile tracks on either side of the line. Government reservation of public lands greatly raised the price received by the railroads when they later sold this land to new inhabitants of the area. The railroads thus received another gift from the government, this time in the form of a monopoly gain at the expense of the consumers. The railroads were not ignorant of the monopolistic advantages that would be conferred upon them by conservation laws. In fact, the railroads were the financial angel of the entire conservation movement. Thus, Louise Peffer writes, There was a definite basis for the charge that the railroads were interested in a repeal of various laws permitting easy transfer of the public domain to the hands of private settlers. The National Irrigation Association, which was the most vigorous advocate of land law reform outside of the administration, was financed in part by the transcontinental railroads and by the Burlington and the Rock Island railroads to the amount of $39,000 a year, out of a total budget of around $50,000. The program of this association and the railroads, as announced by James J. Hill, a preeminent railroad magnet, was almost more advanced than that of the leading conservationists. Senator H. C. Hansbro also pointed out that the railroads paid $45,000 annually to a leading conservationist magazine, The Talisman, and financed the Washington Conservation Lobby. The timber owners also understood the gains they would acquire from forest conservation. President Theodore Roosevelt himself announced that the great users of timber are themselves forwarding the movement for forest preservation. As one student of the problem declared, the lumber manufacturers and timber owners had arrived at a harmonious understanding with Gifford Pinchot, the leader in forest conservation, as early as 1903. In other words, the government, by withdrawing timber lands from entry and keeping them off the market, would aid in appreciating the value of privately owned timber. N. Patents a patent is a grant of monopoly privilege by the government to first discoverers of certain types of inventions. The patent was instituted in England by King Charles I as a transparent means of evading the parliamentary prohibition of grants of monopoly in 1624. Some defenders of patents assert that they are not monopoly privileges, but simply property rights in inventions, or even in ideas. But in free market or libertarian law, everyone's right to property is defended without a patent. If someone has an idea or plan and produces an invention, which is then stolen from his house, the stealing is an act of theft, illegal under general law. On the other hand, patents actually invade the property rights of those independent discoverers of an idea or an invention who happen to make the discovery after the patentee. These later inventors and innovators are prevented by force from employing their own ideas and their own property. Furthermore, in a free society, the innovator could market his invention and stamp it copyright, thereby preventing buyers from reselling the same or a duplicate product.
Patents, therefore, invade rather than defend property rights. The speciousness of the argument that patents protect property rights in ideas is demonstrated by the fact that not all, but only certain types of original ideas, certain types of innovations, are considered legally patentable. Numerous new ideas are never treated as subject to patent grants. Another common argument for patents is that society simply makes a contract with the inventor to purchase his secret, so that society will have use of it. But in the first place, society could then pay a straight subsidy or price to the inventor. It does not have to prevent all later inventors from marketing their inventions in this field. Secondly, there is nothing in the free economy to prevent any individual or group of individuals from purchasing secret inventions from their creators. No monopolistic patent is therefore necessary. The most popular argument for patents among economists is the utilitarian one that a patent for a certain number of years is necessary to encourage a sufficient amount of research expenditure toward inventions and innovations in new processes and products. This is a curious argument, because the question immediately arises, by what standard do you judge that research expenditures are too much, too little, or just about enough? Resources in society are limited, and they may be used for countless alternative ends. By what standards does one determine that certain uses are excessive, that certain uses are insufficient, etc.? Someone observes that there is little investment in Arizona, but a great deal in Pennsylvania. He indignantly asserts that Arizona deserves more investment. But what standards can he use to justify such a statement? The market does have a rational standard, the highest money incomes and highest profits, for these may be achieved only through maximum service to the consumers. This principle of maximum service to consumers and producers alike, that is, to everybody, governs the seemingly mysterious market allocation of resources, how much to devote to one firm or another to one area or another, to the present or the future, to one good or another, to research rather than other forms of investment. The observer who criticizes this allocation can have no rational standards for decision. He has only his arbitrary whim. This is particularly true of criticism of production relations in contrast to interference with consumption. Someone who chides consumers for buying too many cosmetics may have, rightly or wrongly, some rational basis for his criticism. But someone who thinks that more or less of a certain resource should be used in a certain manner, or that business firms are too large or too small, or that too much or too little is spent on research or is invested in a new machine, can have no rational basis for his criticism. Businesses, in short, are producing for a market guided by the valuations of consumers on that market. Outside observers may criticize the ultimate valuations of consumers if they choose, although if they interfere with consumption based on these valuations, they impose a loss of utility upon the consumers but they cannot legitimately criticize the means, the allocations of factors by which these ends are served. Capital funds are limited, as are all other resources, and they must be allocated to various uses, one of which is research expenditures. On the market, Rational decisions are made with regard to setting research expenditures in accordance with the best entrepreneurial expectations of future returns. To subsidize research expenditures by coercion would restrict the satisfaction of consumers and producers on the market.
Many advocates of patents believe that the ordinary competitive processes of the market do not sufficiently encourage the adoption of new processes, and that therefore innovations must be coercively promoted by the government. But the market decides on the rate of introduction of new processes, just as it decides on the rate of industrialization of a new geographic area. In fact, this argument for patents is very similar to the infant industry argument for tariffs: that market procedures are not sufficient to permit the introduction of worthy new processes. And again, the answer is the same. That people must balance the superior productivity of the new processes against the cost of installing them. That is, against the advantage possessed by the old process in being already in existence. Conferring special coercive privileges upon innovation would needlessly scrap valuable plants already in existence and impose an excessive burden upon consumers. Nor is it by any means self-evident even that patents encourage an increase in the absolute quantity of research expenditures. But certainly, we can say that patents distort the allocation of factors on the type of research being conducted. For while it is true that the first discoverer benefits from the privilege, it is also true that his competitors are excluded from production in the area of the patent for many years. And since a later patent can build on an earlier related one in the same field, competitors can often be discouraged indefinitely from further research expenditures in the general area covered by the patent. Moreover, the patentee himself is discouraged from engaging in further research in this field, for the privilege permits him to rest on his laurels for the entire period of the patent, with the assurance that no competitor can trespass on his domain. The competitive spur to further research is eliminated. Research expenditures, therefore, are overstimulated in the early stages before anyone has a patent, and unduly restricted in the period after the patent is received. In addition, some inventions are considered patentable, while others are not. The patent system thus has the further effect of artificially stimulating research expenditures in the patentable areas, while artificially restricting research in the non-patentable areas. As Arnold Plant summed up the problem of competitive research expenditures and innovations. Neither can it be assumed that inventors would cease to be employed if entrepreneurs lost the monopoly over the use of their inventions. Businesses employ them today for the production of non-patentable inventions, and they do not do so merely for the profit which priority secures. In active competition, no business can afford to lag behind its competitors. The reputation of a firm depends upon its ability to keep ahead, to be first in the market with new improvements in its products and new reductions in their prices. Finally, of course, the market itself provides an easy and effective course for those who feel that there are not enough expenditures being made in certain directions on the free market. They are free to make these expenditures themselves. Those who would like to see more inventions made and exploited are at liberty to join together and subsidize such efforts in any way they think best. In doing so, they would, as consumers, add resources to the research and invention business, and they would not then be forcing other consumers to lose utility by conferring monopoly grants and distorting the allocation of the market. Their voluntary expenditures would become part of the market and help to express its ultimate consumer valuations. Furthermore, later inventors would not be restricted.
The friends of invention could accomplish their aims without calling in the state and imposing losses on the mass of consumers. Patents, like any monopoly grant, confer a privilege on one and restrict the entry of others, thereby distorting the freely competitive pattern of industry. If the product is sufficiently demanded by the public, the patentee will be able to achieve a monopoly price. Patentees, instead of marketing their invention themselves, may elect either to 1. sell their privilege to another, or 2. keep the patent privilege but sell licenses to other firms, permitting them to market the invention. The patent privilege thereby becomes a capitalized monopoly gain. It will tend to sell at the price that capitalizes the expected future monopoly gain to be derived from it. Licensing is equivalent to renting capital, and a license will tend to sell at a price equal to the discounted sum of the rental income that the patent will earn for the period of the license. A system of general licensing is equivalent to a tax on the use of the new process, except that the patentee receives the tax instead of the government. This tax restricts production in comparison with the free market, thereby raising the price of the product and reducing the consumer's standard of living. It also distorts the allocation of resources, keeping factors out of these processes and forcing them to enter less value-productive fields. Most current critics of patents direct their fire not at the patents themselves, but at alleged monopolistic abuses in their use. They fail to realize that the patent itself is the monopoly and that, when someone is granted a monopoly privilege, it should occasion neither surprise nor indignation when he makes full use of it. O. Franchises and Public Utilities Franchises are generally grants of permission by the government for the use of its streets. Where the franchises are exclusive or restrictive, they are grants of monopoly or quasi-monopoly privilege. Where they are general and not exclusive, however, they cannot be called monopolistic. For the franchise question is complicated by the fact that the government owns the streets and therefore must give permission before anyone uses them. In a truly free market, of course, streets would be privately, not governmentally owned, and the problem of franchises would not arise. The fact that the government must give permission for the use of its streets has been cited to justify stringent government regulations of public utilities, many of which, like water or electric companies, must make use of the streets. The regulations are then treated as a voluntary quid pro quo, but to do so overlooks the fact that governmental ownership of the streets is itself a permanent act of intervention. Regulation of public utilities or of any other industry discourages investment in these industries, thereby depriving consumers of the best satisfaction of their wants for it distorts the resource allocations of the free market. Prices set below the free market create an artificial shortage of the utility service. Prices set above those determined by the free market impose restrictions and a monopoly price on the consumers. Guaranteed rates of return exempt the utility from the free play of market forces and impose burdens on the consumers by distorting market allocations. The very term, public utility, furthermore, is an absurd one. Every good is useful to the public, and almost every good, if we take a large enough chunk of supply as the unit, may be considered necessary. Any designation of a few industries as public utilities is completely arbitrary and unjustified. P. The Right of Eminent Domain
In contrast to the franchise, which may be made general and non-exclusive, as long as the central organization of force continues to own the streets, the right of eminent domain could not easily be made general. If it were, then chaos would truly ensue. For when the government confers a privilege of eminent domain, as it has done on railroads and many other businesses, it has virtually granted a license for theft. If everyone had the right of eminent domain, every man would be legally empowered to compel the sale of property that he wanted to buy. If A were compelled to sell property to B at the latter's will, and vice versa, then neither could be called the owner of his own property. The entire system of private property would then be scrapped in favor of a society of mutual plunder. Saving and accumulation of property for oneself and one's heirs would be severely discouraged, and rampant plunder would cut ever more sharply into whatever property remained. Civilization would soon revert to barbarism, and the standards of living of the barbarian would prevail. The government itself is the original holder of the right of eminent domain, and the fact that the government can despoil any property holder at will is evidence that, in current society, the right to private property is only flimsily established. Certainly no one can say that the inviolability of private property is protected by the government, and when the government confers this power on a particular business, it is conferring upon it the special privilege of taking property by force. Evidently, the use of this privilege greatly distorts the structure of production. Instead of being determined by voluntary exchange, self-ownership, and efficient satisfaction of consumer wants, Prices and the allocation of productive resources are now determined by brute force and government favor. The result is an overextension of resources, a malinvestment in the privileged firm or industry, and an underinvestment in other firms and industries. At any given time, as we have stressed, there is a limited amount of capital a limited supply of all resources that can be devoted to investment. Compulsory increase in investment in one field can be achieved only by an arbitrary decline in investment in other fields. Inevitably, someone will point to the plight of the railroad or highway company that must pay extortionate rates to the man who merely owns the property along the way. Yet these same people do not complain, and properly so, of the fact that property values have enormously increased in downtown areas of cities, thus benefiting someone who merely happens to own them. The fact is that all property is available to everyone who finds or buys it. If the property owner in these cases is penalized because of his speculation, then all entrepreneurs must be penalized for their correct forecasting of future events. Furthermore, economic progress imputes gains to original factors, land and labor. To render land artificially cheap is to lead to its overuse, and the government is then actually imposing a maximum price on the land in question. Many advocates of eminent domain contend that society, in the last analysis, has the right to use any land for its purposes. Without knowing it, they have thus conceded the validity of a major Henry Georgist plank, that every person, by virtue of his birth, has a right to his aliquot share of God-given land, except that the eminent domain thesis is on even shakier ground, since the Georgists at least exempt or try to exempt from the social claim the improvements that the owner has made.
Actually, however, since society does not exist as an entity, it is impossible for each individual to translate his theoretical aliquot right into real ownership. As Benjamin R. Tucker pointed out years ago, the Georgist equal rights thesis, or eminent domain, leads logically not to a single tax, but to each individual's right to appropriate his theoretical share of the value of everybody else's land. The state's appropriation of this value then becomes sheer robbery of the other individual claims, rather than of just the claim of the landowner. Therefore, the ownership of the property devolves not on everybody, but on the government, or on those individuals whom it specially privileges. Q. Bribery of Government Officials Because it is illegal, bribery of government officials receives practically no mention in economic works. Economic science, however, should analyze all aspects of mutual exchange, whether these exchanges are legal or illegal. We have seen that bribery of a private firm is not actually bribery at all, but simply payment of the market price for the product. Bribery of government officials is also a price for the payment of a service. What is this service? It is the failure to enforce the government edict as it applies to the particular person paying the bribe. In short, the acceptance of a bribe is equivalent to the sale of permission to engage in a certain line of business. Acceptance of a bribe is therefore praxeologically identical with the sale of a government license to engage in a business or occupation, and the economic effects are similar to those of a license. There is no economic difference between the purchase of a government permission to operate by buying a license or by paying government officials informally. What the briber receives, therefore, is an informal oral license to operate. The fact that different government officials receive the money in the two cases is irrelevant to our discussion. The extent to which an informal license acts as a grant of monopolistic privilege depends on the conditions under which it is granted. In some instances, the official accepts a bribe by one person and, in effect, grants him a monopoly in a particular area or occupation. In other cases, the official may grant the informal license to anybody who is willing to pay the necessary price. The former is an example of a clear monopoly grant followed by a possible monopoly price. In the latter case, the bribe acts as a lump-sum tax, penalizing poorer competitors who cannot pay. They are forced out of business by the bribe system. However, we must remember that bribery is a consequence of the outlawing of a certain line of production, and therefore that it serves to mitigate some of the loss of utility imposed on consumers and producers by the government prohibition. Given the state of outlawry, bribery is the chief means for the market to reassert itself. Bribery moves the economy closer to the free market situation. The same is true of an official license. A firm's payment for a license is the only means for it to exist. A licensed firm cannot be stamped as a willing party to the monopolistic privilege unless it had helped to lobby for the licensing law's establishment or continuance, as very often happens. In fact, we must distinguish between an invasive bribe and a defensive bribe. The defensive bribe is what we have been discussing, that is, the purchase of a permission to operate after an activity is outlawed. On the other hand, a bribe to attain an exclusive or quasi-exclusive permission, barring others from the field, is an example of an invasive bribe, a payment for a grant of monopolistic privilege. The former is a significant movement toward the free market, 
The latter is a movement away from it. R. Policy toward monopoly. Economic historians often inquire about the extent and importance of monopoly in the economy. Almost all of this inquiry has been misdirected because the concept of monopoly has never been cogently defined. In this chapter, we have traced types of monopoly and quasi-monopoly and their economic effects. It is clear that the term monopoly properly applies only to governmental grants of privilege, direct and indirect. Truly gauging the extent of monopoly in an economy means studying the degree and extent of monopoly and quasi-monopoly privilege that the government has granted. American opinion has been traditionally anti-monopoly. Yet it is clearly not only pointless, but deeply ironic to call upon the government to pursue a positive anti-monopoly policy. Evidently, all that is necessary to abolish monopoly is that the government abolish its own creations. It is certainly true that in many, if not all, cases, the privileged businesses or laborers had themselves agitated for the monopolistic grant, but it is still true that they could not become quasi-monopolists except through the intervention of the state. It is therefore the action of the state that must bear prime responsibility. Historians, however, will go sadly astray if they ignore the monopolistic motivation for passage of such measures by the state. Historians who are in favor of the free market often neglect this problem, and thus leave themselves wide open to opposition charges that they are apologists for monopoly capital. Actually, of course, advocates of the free market are pro-business, as they are pro-any voluntary relationship, only when it is carried on in the free market. They oppose governmental grants of monopolistic privilege to businesses or others, for to this extent, business is no longer free, but a partner of the coercive state. Finally, the question may be raised, are corporations themselves mere grants of monopoly privilege? Some advocates of the free market were persuaded to accept this view by Walter Lippmann's The Good Society. It should be clear from previous discussion, however, that corporations are not at all monopolistic privileges. They are free associations of individuals pooling their capital, on the purely free market, such men would simply announce to their creditors that their liability is limited to the capital specifically invested in the corporation, and that beyond this their personal funds are not liable for debts, as they would be under a partnership arrangement. It then rests with the sellers and lenders to this corporation to decide whether or not they will transact business with it. If they do, then they proceed at their own risk. Thus, the government does not grant corporations a privilege of limited liability. Anything announced and freely contracted for in advance is a right of a free individual, not a special privilege. It is not necessary that governments grant charters to corporations. It is true that limited liability for torts is the illegitimate conferring of a special privilege, but this does not loom large among the total liabilities of any corporation. Appendix A. On Private Coinage The common erroneous phrasing of Gresham's Law, Bad Money Drives Out Good Money, has often been used to attack the concept of private coinage as unworkable, and thereby to defend the state's age-old monopolization of the minting business. As we have seen, however, Gresham's law applies to the effect of government policy, not to the free market. The argument most often advanced against private coinage is that the public would be burdened by fraudulent coin and would be forced to test coins frequently for their weight and fineness. 
The government's stamp on the coin is supposed to certify its fineness and weight. The long record of the abuse of this certification by governments is well known. Moreover, the argument is hardly unique to the mitting business. It proves far too much. In the first place, those mitters who fraudulently certify the weight or fineness of coins will be prosecuted for fraud, just as defrauders are prosecuted now. Those who counterfeit the certifications of well-established private mitters will meet a fate similar to those who counterfeit money today. Numerous products of business depend upon their weight and purity. People will either safeguard their wealth by testing the weight and purity of their coins as they do their money bullion, or they will mint their coins with private mitters who have established a reputation for probity and efficiency. These mitters will place their stamps on the coins, and the best mitters will soon come into prominence as coiners and as assayers of previously minted coins. Thus, ordinary prudence, the development of goodwill toward honest and efficient business firms, and legal prosecutions against fraud and counterfeiting, would suffice to establish an orderly monetary system. There are numerous industries where the use of instruments of precise weight and fineness are essential, and where a mistake would be of greater import than an error involving coins. Yet prudence and the process of market selection of the best firms, coupled with legal prosecution against fraud, have facilitated the purchase and use of the most delicate machine tools, for example, without any suggestion that the government must nationalize the machine tool industry in order to ensure the quality of the products. Another argument against private coinage is that standardizing the denominations of coin is more convenient than permitting the diversity of coins that would ensue under a free system. The answer is that if the market finds standardization more convenient, private mints will be led by consumer demand to confine their minting to certain standard denominations. On the other hand, if greater variety is preferred, consumers will demand and obtain a more diverse range of coins. Under the government mintage monopoly, the desires of consumers for various denominations are ignored, and the standardization is compulsory, rather than in accord with public demand. Appendix B. Coercion and Lebensraum Tariffs and immigration barriers as a cause of war may be thought far afield from our study, but actually this relationship may be analyzed praxeologically. A tariff imposed by Government A prevents an exporter residing under Government B from making a sale. Furthermore, an immigration barrier imposed by Government A prevents a resident of B from migrating. Both of these impositions are effected by coercion. Tariffs as a prelude to war have often been discussed. Less understood is the Lebensraum argument. Overpopulation of one particular country, insofar as it is not the result of a voluntary choice to remain in the homeland at the cost of a lower standard of living, is always the result of an immigration barrier imposed by another country. It may be thought that this barrier is purely a domestic one. But is it? By what right does the government of a territory proclaim the power to keep other people away? Under a purely free market system, only individual property owners have the right to keep people off their property. The government's power rests on the implicit assumption that the government owns all the territory that it rules. Only then can the government keep people out of that territory. Caught in an insoluble contradiction are those believers in the free market and private property who still uphold immigration barriers. They can do so only if they concede that the state is the owner of all property, 
but in that case they cannot have true private property in their system at all. In a truly free market system, such as we have outlined, only first cultivators would have title to unowned property. Property that has never been used would remain unowned until someone used it. At present, the state owns all unused property, but it is clear that this is conquest incompatible with the free market. In a truly free market, for example, it would be inconceivable that an Australian agency could arise, laying claim to ownership over the vast tracts of unused land on that continent, and using force to prevent people from other areas from entering and cultivating that land. It would also be inconceivable that a state could keep people from other areas out of property that the domestic property owner wishes them to use. No one but the individual property owner himself would have sovereignty over a piece of property.